Well, can you believe this weekend marks five years since the Nashville Predators Stanley Cup final run? Yeah, time just sneaks up on you, doesn't it? Today, we are going to be looking back at the five years since Nashville made the Cup the memories that we made during the Stanley Cup Finals run, and how that Finals appearance shaped Nashville both on and off the ice. There's a lot of good and bad there. We're going to be talking about that today on a very special Locked on Predators podcast. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Predators your first listen of the day every single day. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor at OnTheForeCheck.com. I normally have a partner in crime, Ann Kimmel, but she is still on vacation. So instead, we have reached out to the man, the myth, maybe the legend, Alex <laughs> Doherty from A to Z Sports. Alex, how are you doing, my man? What's up, Nick? How are you? I'm doing good, man. It's, it's, been a, it's been a week. It has been a season. It's, it feels yes. like we're still kind of recovering from the past uh, nine months of Predators hockey. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I, I, I actually have not watched much hockey after the Predators were knocked out. I've watched a few th- few games here and there, but I, I've been just kind of unplugging myself for the last couple weeks. As I'm yeah. sure most people have. <laughs> yeah, I was on vacation last week uh, and didn't see any hockey whatsoever. I was keeping up via scores, and I was just like, I came back and was like, "This is kind of refreshing." I I saw I, I the one game I watched like almost all the way through was when the Penguins got knocked out um, for reasons we might go into later uh, related, but uh, I, I seeing that team get knocked out is always kind of fun because <laughs> like yeah. the penguins They're, and then um I, and then i've watched i've watched a good bit of this uh the blues ad series which has been pretty entertaining for other reasons but um yeah i i, I mean I, did, I forgot the florida and tampa and all that happened like i, I just i haven't even really paid attention carolina i did, I, I totally forgot carolina was in the playoffs yeah it seems it seems like a year ago since the preds were even in at this point it's like oh yeah the preds were in the stanley cup playoffs like it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Like when you get to the Stanley cup finals and your team gets like round one and you start seeing like highlights of that team. And it's like, Oh yeah. Like that just seems like an entire lifetime ago. Yeah. It's wild. especially this year because of how brief the predators appearance was in the playoffs and, yeah. and bad. <laughs> Less we forget. <laughs> Literally, we are trying yeah. to forget. Yeah. But one thing we're not trying to forget, the magic of the 2017 Stanley Cup Finals run. May 29th, 2017 was game one between the Predators and Penguins. And of course, this Sunday, May 29th, is going to be the five-year anniversary of that. First off, Alex, main question for you. Dear God, has it already been five years? I mean, I still remember almost every moment of this, like it happened yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so I have a un- I, what I think is maybe a little bit of a unique perspective on just how long it has been. My daughter was born November 2016. So she is now five years old. She's basically grown up you know like she during the stanley cup final run of 2017 she was six months old so it was like basically however old she is will be how old it has been how long it has been since that run for me anyways and so i i for some reason i'll always think about it like that obviously it's my daughter so it's a little bit more powerful but also yeah it, it, i mean in the five years it has felt like literally a lifetime uh since since that whole like craziness unfolded and um yeah i I mean at the time i was writing for on the forecheck i was the the co-managing editor for on the forecheck and um i i I have a lot of memories from that whole spring and like how a lot of things unfolded i could even give some behind the scenes magic of of what was going on with on the forecheck at the time you were were you on board yet I was yeah. not on board yet. I was okay. still doing sports in Atlanta at that time. Okay. Yeah. But you came on 
soon after then, didn't you? I came on um, right after the 2019 season. So oh, right okay. – like three weeks after they lost to the stars is when I started writing. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. I guess I thought it was earlier than that, but cause we made a whole round of hires after the cup run, which included Sean. It included Eric, uh, Kate, of course, and several other, I, uh, I think Rachel was in that round. Um, several, several others, but anyways, uh, that was an explosion of, of like, We'll, we'll get into it, but basically we went from not a lot of people helping out yeah. to a lot of people on board, which was kind of nice. So, um, but yeah, it, it has been quite a long time since that run. It was, it's crazy to think about. Yeah. I remember it cause I was watching it from the outside looking in. I had left channel four at that point and I was working in Atlanta and I kind of remember the FOMO um of just being there for like every step of the way uh because if i was still in nashville i would have been like you know front and center for everything would have seen like the celebrations in the streets and everything like that Mm -hmm. um and i had serious fomo because i was watching you know the first two games of the stanley cup finals on the road down in georgia and you know i saw you know, the, the parties on lower Broadway, like the watch parties and stuff like that. Um, and I was just thinking, man, like, how do you even compare downtown Nashville? Like what's happening at this moment to, to anything else? I mean, the only thing you could say is like, this is CMA fest on crack cocaine, basically, where it's just, everybody's there for, you know, one night, like one watch party. Yeah. Uh, and I I did get to go back by chance. Uh, one of my buddies was getting married in Nashville the night of game three. Mm. Um, and for, as soon as he figured that out, he was like, of course, like, of course, like planning this wedding for like two years. And it just happens to be in Nashville the night of game three of the playoffs. Yeah. And, eventually it was it was at like a country club and eventually like after the ceremony after first dance and stuff like that he's just like i i can't we got to turn the tvs on <laughs> so you know yeah. the dj is going on and stuff but you know he even the bride were all like lined up like around the bar they have watching you know the, the game three go down and it was just like man this is like this is crazy. Like I've never, I was in Nashville, you know, for the 99, 2000 Tennessee Titans thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was probably a little bit too young to kind of appreciate that. But this was like, you know, kind of my first taste of being a front and center in a city as they're chasing a cup. And it was wild. Yeah, it was. So that game three, was on a Saturday. I like, I can, as you mentioned, you were at, or at a wedding, uh, which I'm sure was on a Saturday, but it, that, that was, that was a, a Saturday. And it, so it worked out where um, I want to say that that was CMA fest too, right? Like that was also the CMA fest weekend or if I'm, I'm remembering that correctly. I think it was, it was either that weekend or the next week. And I can't remember. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's what it was, but uh, you know, I had, I, I have memories of CMA prior to 2017. I have memories of CMA Fest being a pretty big deal. I mean, like pretty, pretty crowded downtown. Like you you kind of avoided the downtown area if you were going to be trying to get anywhere. But uh, that game three and and the, the, the cold cup final, the three games that were played in Nashville uh, blew everything away. I mean, totally, totally different. I mean, uh, not only were streets blocked off, but like you couldn't, you couldn't even really walk anywhere. Like you, you were squeezing through people. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't just like a casual stroll. Uh, even like Titans games where they broadcasted the games down, like the AFC Championship game against the Chiefs a few years ago, they broadcasted that game downtown. There, you could walk pretty easily from from one side of the street to the other. Yeah. The Cup Final, wall to wall people, all wearing gold and. Uh, some yellow for the Pittsburgh fans that were there. Uh, I mean, as soon as you got into the area of where Broadway was on any of the side streets, but even just close to Broadway, just wall to wall people, you were squeezing through the bars, of course, just, you couldn't even go inside. Oh God. And, uh, and, and well, part of the reason for that actually 
was a logistical issue because they had the giant screens sitting in the middle of the streets and they were kind of clogging things up and there were barricades and such. But um, I mean, not since and not before had I ever seen anything like that in downtown Nashville. It was, it's the wildest that I've seen Nashville ever. Um, And I went, I went to school in downtown Nashville. I went to school at Heme Fog, which is right on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And I've seen kind of a lot of, I mean, prior to, prior to 2017, I had never seen anything even close and I haven't seen anything since either. Now the NFL draft, when that was here, that was pretty big, but I wasn't, I didn't go downtown for that, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, and I kind of remember walking around either it was, you know, the day after game three, the day before game four. Mm. Um, and it was just Preds everywhere. <clears throat> like a random person walking down the street had one of those, you know, PK Subban, you know, sort of jerseys on or somebody yeah. just have like a casual like Preds polo shirt. You know, if they're walking out of work, there's posters, there's banners in every corner, like even, you know, some of some of the law offices or print offices, like every single building you passed had some sort of Preds thing on it. Yeah. Um, and that was such a sight to see because it wasn't just, you know, the Preds in the finals. It was kind of a celebration of how far the team had come. Yeah. Because it, it, it really did feel like obviously in retrospect, it sucks that we lost the Stanley Cup finals, um, you know. It sucks that we couldn't win the cup. It sucks that we got knocked out short of our goal. But if there was ever a time in which you would apply the term just happy to be here Mm -hmm. in terms of a Nashville sports moment, that Stanley Cup finals, I think, was a phrase in which a lot of people would say at the time, they're just happy to be at this point, even though we had the heartbreaking loss. You know, yeah. even though it sucks that you came up short, there's some nefarious stuff with, you know, especially the way they got knocked out, the Sissons no goal, all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. It still feels like you can look back and say, it's like, it was cool that we were even just there at the time. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I mean, I've, I've consistently said, and no one seems to agree with me on this. And I, I, I'm, I'm in a very small minority of people to believe this, that, believes that the winning the Clarence Campbell bowl, the Western conference final winning that was a big accomplishment. Like that, that is a big deal. Uh, I'm just, I feel the same way about winning the president's trophy. Like that is a massive, massive trophy. If this were European, so- if this were a European soccer league, it would be just as celebrated as the league cup. You know, there's, there's the league, you winning the league premier league. And then there's like winning the UEFA champions league. Like those, those are, almost equal. I mean, some people would say the Champions League is bigger. Some people would say winning the Premier League is bigger. It's like winning your league, the regular season is a big deal. But anyways, no one seems to, no one seems to agree with me. I think I'm I'm already there. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah. I, 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 I think that, I think that people who really consider what sports should be would agree with that because like that, that is an impressive accomplishment, but even just the Western conference final beating the ducks in game in six games, I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. Like going to a Stanley cup final is pretty, pretty major. I mean, like, that's a big deal. A lot of teams, there's teams that haven't done that. And uh, so that, that's one thing, but also the, the other thing that stands out is the, the predators performance in the Stanley cup final in the, in the six games was outstanding in Nashville. I mean, like they destroyed Pittsburgh in Nashville, like, yeah. The 5-1 score in game three, the 4-1 score in game – I think it was 4-1 in game four. Um, they just, like, just be- beat them down. Of course, they got beat down when they went back to Pittsburgh all three times. Yeah. But uh, – well, well, game one was a little bit weird because, remember, that was the yeah. – they went – Pittsburgh went up 3 nothing, and then, what, Nashville held them for – I think it was like an entire period and a half. Like, I think it was something like almost 30 minutes of game time without a shot on goal for Pittsburgh or something like that. And that three, and that three, nothing score would have been three, one, or maybe different if if the Forsberg or the, sorry, the Subban goal counted. But yeah, I mean, you're right. In game one, Nashville might've been the better team. They definitely weren't the better team in game two. And then definitely not in game five where they got blown out. But, um, yeah, but so 
contrasting like that performance with anything we've seen since where like in all of the, in all of the playoff series since the Stanley cup final in 2017, the predators have had, I, I don't think they've ever had quite as dominant a, um, approach or a dominant a performance as they did in all three home games in that Stanley cup final. Like they were so good. And, and part of that, part of that, vibe that was happening during that whole thing and the, and the city come together in that in that one like week period was how good they were on the ice like it wasn't just that they were like no one no one seemed to care what was happening in pittsburgh in those other games yeah. like when they came to nashville it was like massive and and they were destroying them and freddie goudreau is scoring and Mike Fisher makes that pass to Victor Arvidsson and Roman Yossi scoring and James Neal scoring. Like all of the big names are, are showing up. And, uh, and even though, even though we knew, you know, Brian Johansson was going to be out and Kevin Biel is out, even though we knew that we were shorthanded, that the team was like all about performing on, on the ice and, and, and like the, the fans knew it too. So like I, that sticks out to me as well as like, not only was it just a big moment for the city, but the the team responded to that. How many times since have we seen like a big moment for the team come up and like, they don't really respond. And like, now we're starting to see like the fans are not even responding as much. And so it's like, since then, it's, that's why it feels so long since that time, because like when both of those things came together, the fans just like totally embraced the city, embracing the team and the team responding with like incredible performances like that just shows you how rare that is. Yeah. That actually leads me to the next topic. And it's a very interesting one. Cause I want to say, did the Stanley cup finals maybe spoil predators fans a little bit? Is that maybe the reason why some there's fan apathy, you know, kind of in the talk. I want to get into that in just a second, but first want to mention today's show brought to you by our friends at athletic greens and their new project or product. AG1. Uh, I take AG1 every day. I did it at first just because they sent me a bunch of free stuff. I've talked about this before. Very skeptical about it at first. Uh, it is basically just looks like a green powder. And I wasn't sure if I was going to be on board with the taste and texture and all that. But I was proven wrong at first because I tried it and it's delicious. It is a smooth vanilla flavor. It's not, you know, this green concoction. It actually tastes great. But at the same time, with one scoop of AG1, you're also absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotic, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, pretty much everything. As soon as I started taking this every day, I noticed my mental focus has been a lot better. I'm getting tired during the day less. I don't have that 2 p.m. crash. Uh, I feel very energized when I need to do a random hockey podcast in the middle of the day. And a lot of people are a little skeptical about the price, but here, break it down like this. It costs you less than $3 a day, which is cheaper than, you know, the cup of coffee you might get at Starbucks every weekday. And it's also cheaper than getting all the different supplements yourself. So with that price, you're investing in an all-in-one nutritional insurance. You can't put a price on your health. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. All again, it's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Alex, you touched on something uh, a second ago when you're kind of talking about, you know, maybe fans not kind of being as energized in some of these playoff games as they were, you know, in that peak 2017 where, you know, I, I think the big moment that stands out to me was – the Freddie Gaudreau goal in game three, which was what 30 seconds after Roman Yossi had tied the game. Gaudreau comes in while the fans are still hyped to make it two to one. The ensuing five minutes after that, 
maybe the loudest I have ever heard Bridgestone Arena from, you know, the the you suck chant, you know, and the it's all your fault chant was so loud and so rehearsed. It sounded like some ancient cult meeting that was happening inside Bridgestone Arena or some giant sing along. That is how <laughs> clear it was. And then just the buzz, the Smashville standing O at every single like stoppage in play. Like that was to me peak, you know, Smashville fandom. That is what put Bridgestone Arena on the map in terms of one of the toughest places to play. And as you mentioned, it just seems like every playoff since then, there's been something a little bit cut off each postseason we've gone. You know, even the next year when the Predators won the President's Trophy, when they were kind of considered one of the favorites to win the Cup that year. You know, the, the Colorado series, there seemed to be a little bit less of a buzz. That Winnipeg series, it picked up a little bit, but, you know, there's uh -huh. still moments where it just seemed dead. Um, and then, you know, you had Dallas the, the next year. That didn't seem as much buzz as there used to be. Um, you know, not counting the next two playoffs, probably because, you know, they're the COVID stuff. Although I will say the Carolina series, it got loud despite, you know, only having half the arena full. Um, but this... This series, especially against Colorado, it just seemed like it was so deflating. And I don't know if it was kind of the circumstances going in to, to the playoff series and, that, you know, having to survive that game one um, where fans just didn't think they had a chance. But, you know, there was a lot of empty seats. Bridgestone was quiet for big chunks of time, even though, you know, in moments where it looked like the Preds had some momentum going – it just it just seems different. It seems like it's kind of gone down every time since the Stanley Cup Finals. So my question to you is, do you think that is sort of the expectation? The Stanley Cup Finals has been the expectation and everything now just seems kind of blasé? Or is this, you know, maybe some of the fandom starting to lose interest? I do think that the only way you will see the the crowd return to that level from 2017 is if they go to the Stanley Cup final again. Maybe if they re reach like the Western Conference final, that would be enough. But I, I think that they reached a peak there. I, things reached a peak there that are going to be very hard to return to naturally. So I think there's kind of two things that have happened simultaneously over the last five years. One is – a sort of trans transformation of the fan base from a diehard hockey market that really, I mean, for years, it was really only hockey fans that, uh, that, that attended ho uh, Predators games. Like, casual sports fans really weren't into it. I mean, it, they just weren't. Like, they, were, they would go for the atmosphere, the cool, the, the, in, the, the intrigue, uh of it but it really wasn't about like hockey hockey there was a huge core of, of real hockey fans that were there and they loved it that was th those core of hockey fans were who were getting really really loud for that Stanley Cup final and all throughout that run but you've had this transformation of the fan base from that in where you've drawn on all of these sort of casual fans uh into Predators fans not to say that they're not fans but they're just they kind of have transformed they've, they've they've siphoned off some, some people who were just only football guys or some siphoned off some people who were more into just like baseball or, or, or soccer maybe. And like, Hey, go check out this hockey team or basketball fans. That's, that's probably a better example mm -hmm. that just like here, go watch basketball on ice. It's really, really fun. And the predators are really good. So like there's been this transformation of the fan base from a really hockey focused uh, diehard group to a blending of those people and casual sports fans. And those casual sports fans that like still want to go to games and maybe even buy season tickets, when the team doesn't perform as well, they just don't get into it as much. Like it's that they, they they came over. I, I hesitate to call them front runners. I think it's more just they are kind of borrowed. They, they're kind of sharing the experience for now. They don't necessarily they haven't bought into it quite as much. Mm -hmm. So that's happened. And then the other thing that I think has happened is uh, there is there is a a for, for many years, there was an organic, natural 
fan grassroots movement to try to generate energy in that building. Now it is almost all structured and manufactured by the team. Yeah. And I'm talking about from the music that they play from the, okay, who's, who's going to be the flag, the, the, who's going to be the towel waver this time. Who's going to be the, who's going to be the anthem singer. Who's going to be the hype man or whatever. Who's going to be on the stage. Like all that stuff is, is, is interesting and cool, but it is very much just governed by the team. It is not governed by the fans. And in addition to like all the, the videos and stuff, the game ops going on in the middle of the game, that stuff has become much more structured and manufactured by the team and less about less by the fans. So when you have those two things kind of happening at once, I think that has led to the, the change in atmosphere. And, and then you can also throw in the other stuff, all the, all of the logistical things, prices going up, uh, the, the COVID pandemic, econ- possible economic recession going on, like people not as interested in spending the money to go downtown. I mean, it's expensive to go to a game. Uh, parking being crazy downtown, that kind of stuff. So it, uh, traffic, it, there's a lot of things, other things contributing to it. But I really think those first two are the main things. The, cha- the transformation of the fan base that's blending all these like casual sports fans in. And then also – the the hype and the energy is more manufactured, less natural than it used to be. And it's, it's interesting because you hear a lot of, you know, older fans, you know, on Twitter kind of talk about how they feel like management kind of shifted their focus from them to maybe the more casual fans, maybe kind of yeah. catering to a national audience. Um, you know, one, one example I can kind of think of is remember the pedal tavern, yeah, the whole pedal tavern thing uh, yeah. a couple of years ago. Um, that, that's a very small thing that obviously didn't work out, but mm-hmm. you know that was a case of hey, you know Nashville's known for for their pedal taverns. Maybe this is a way to you know hey, here's a Nashville experience if you come. Whereas I'm sure if you talk to like a lot of people who were born and raised in Nashville and who'd kind of been Preds fans since the very beginning, they're like, this yeah. is dumb we hate this, but (laughs) there's, there is kind of moments like that. And, you know, the Dirks Bentley song for the, for the power play, which Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think was that bad. Right. Right. I I like DMX better, but I didn't think it was that bad, but it's like stuff like that, that kind of ties into the, the manufactured kind of thing. It's like, let's try to make this a Nashville experience as opposed to kind of being like, let's go with the vibe of our fan base. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that the peak, of, I, one memory that stands out to me uh, a lot from the, from 2017. So in game six against the ducks, they're up, you know, uh, so Colton Sisson scores the goal to go up four to three. I think it was. And then shortly thereafter, I think is when Austin Watson scored maybe and made it five, three. I think that was the, it was the Philip Forsberg, like full length of the ice. Em- just empty kind of net. Mary that hap- net that happened first. That happened first. You're right. So like that was so, well, okay. So right before the Philip Forsberg empty netter, they played uh shout. Yeah. You know, a fan favorite. And, and there's a, there's actually a video on YouTube of, uh, of a, of a fan in the arena who recorded this whole thing. And this is, this is, I think the peak of, like like natural organic energy in the building generating some sort of hype uh, because what happens is like the entire arena I will never forget how the entire arena was singing this song and going nuts because they were up four to three they had a they had to it was like three minutes left or something and then like of course after this I mean the shout the whole shout like choreography thing is a pretty long. I mean, it's like a, it's like three or four minutes of like doing that and everyone doing the shout stuff and people are just going crazy. I will never forget it. It was so loud and, and like, it was just like a really fun atmosphere. And then like right after that is when Forsberg scores the empty netter and it gets even louder. And so like, that's like, to me, that was the peak of sort of this like organic thing happening, even though, you know, the, the arena was playing the song. It was just, it was more about like everyone just sort of joining in on this. Mm-hmm. And then like, if you think about that as the peak and then to me, the bottom level is the, insistence that they continue to keep playing that one song that that uh glorious song you yeah. just hear it every time it's just it's it's 
Uh, it's not fresh anymore. It's not part of the fan base anymore. Most people don't even know what it is. And it just keeps playing at the beginning of every third period. And they need to let it die. But they continue to let it they, – they, they, they keep reviving it. So, I don't know. I, when I think about, like, the kind of difference in the fan base, I, those are two moments I think about. It's like the peak in the valley. Yeah. You, you kind of think back to – remember when the Blues had Gloria as their anthem? Yeah. And then, like, mm-hmm. I think it was, like, two months into the next season, uh, they were like, no, we're retiring that. I think that was okay. probably an example of, you know what, this yeah. is like, this was like a very in the moment thing, but we don't want to make this a thing. Exactly. The blues did it right. Like, yeah, they, they retired. Boy, Bring, that, and, and that's a, that's a scary it, sentence to say, isn't it? The yeah. blues did it right. I put it in the closet and then like bust it out for like one random playoff game sometime in the future to like actually generate some, Oh yeah. People in his minds are like, remember this from 2019. That's exactly yeah. how they needed to treat glorious. Instead, they just kept pushing play on it every game. For like you know a November game against uh, against Columbus, they're like, yeah, glory, glorious, here yeah. it comes. Uh, yeah, it, they they need to treat it like they do run this town, where they break it out just for the postseason. Like you know that's going to be the you know it's postseason when you hear this. The Red Wings used to do that with their giant uh, inflatable octopus ma- uh, mascot. They used to bring it out like pop it out from like the rafters uh, whenever they were in the postseason, but didn't do that for the regular season. So yeah, a little bit more novelty. Uh, There's more on this conversation I want to talk to, including how do you think the team on the ice has changed since the Stanley cup finals? Uh, Did David Poyle maybe have eyes bigger than his stomach when he was trying to replicate some of the cup run? Uh, But first I want to take a moment to mention today's show brought to you by our friends at bet online. Our partners at bet online continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, MLB scores, fights, next season's NFL futures, and of course, everything you need to know about the Stanley Cup finals. That includes all the wagering information from live betting, esports, prop bets, more. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action Bet online where the game starts. Alex, an interesting debate that's come up um, has been about how the team on the ice has changed uh, since that Stanley Cup finals run. Because, you know, we, we talk about the team identity. You know, that that has been a buzzword a lot, especially this season as it's kind of come back. Do you think in a kind of an attempt to keep the Predators on that pantheon of top NHL contenders that they kind of went away from what the core of their team really was. Um, well, actually, I, I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of the opposite. I think they tried too hard to uh, return to what they thought worked. So was it, was when it I th- this year or like the years right after oh, the, the years right after the cup? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, what I was going to say was, so one thing that I remember as being kind of odd immediately after the the cup run about the way David Poyle, like, reloaded, so so to speak. Mm -hmm. First of all, he makes a trade for Alexi Emelin, an older defenseman, veteran older defenseman. He, he, uh, He signs Nick Bonino. I want to say Mike Fisher signed that offseason as well, like a one-year deal. This is that, prior to him. Fisher or was, was he retired? He, he retired and then came, back, and came back. I think yeah. like February when it became clear the yeah. Predators might have a shot at a cup again. Yeah. So, so yeah, he retired. They they, they signed. Remember they signed Scott Hartnell to like a one-year oh, deal. God, I can so, forget about Scott Hartnell. Yeah. So they make these signings that are like dudes and they think because they think i think david Poyle was thinking at the time like we've already got our core we just need some veteran dudes to add to the to the mix but what it ended up doing was making them older and slower and even though they obviously they that that year they turned it into a president's trophy winning team they were very good that year but it wasn't because of scott hartnell and mike fisher being there for two months and alexi Emelin. like it wasn't those signings it was because of the core but then they also the offseason that they finally signed Johansson and Arvidsson to deals. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, what I think happened was like Poyle somewhere along the way kind of, kind of lost what 
what really worked. And I think that what worked was younger players hungry for contracts that are, that are, that are trying to prove themselves ready to, to step into roles that make sense for them that are like, uh, you know, a, a, a skilled playmaking forward playing with other playmakers and other scorers. And then like big physical guys playing with other big physical guys and having a line that has some, some makes some sense. Mm-hmm. So for, for the bulk of, of the next few years, I think that like they missed on all that. I mean, like they trade Kevin Fiala, they get Ryan Hartman and they don't use him right. And then they just let him, they trade him for Wayne Simmons and that doesn't work out. And th- so many weird decisions. Um, Kyle Turris, done the, I mean, obviously being the one of the bigger ones, Brian, um, Boyle. Brian Boyle, and that worked out okay, but like they didn't resign him. So it was like, okay, I guess he's yeah. gone. Um, maybe one of the better trades they made has been Mark, Borbietsky, or actually, actually, that wasn't a trade. That was a, uh, or was that a trade? Yeah, that was a signing. Yeah, okay. Um, but then, but here's what I think that they've, I think that they've have returned to figuring out their identity. I, I think, I think that some of the things they've, they've done recently have made more sense. And I, part of why I think John Hines makes a lot of sense as a coach is because I think he's, he's finally figuring out some ways to make some, some lines that make sense, even though I know I don't, I disagree with how he's used Tomasino. I disagree with how he how he's used Tolvanen, mm-hmm. but John Hines was the the Dr. Frankenstein that put together the Colton Sissons Trennan Janot line. Like he really made that line work, and I think that that line is one of the better things about next season potentially. You know, mm-hmm. um, so I think that they have gotten back to like maybe let's get ahead of things and figure out what will work as opposed to what used to work a few years ago. So I, I, that's that's what I would say as far as far as like finding their identity and, and recovering that they, they went away from it for years mm-hmm. and suffered in the postseason because of that. Now I think they've kind of returned to it. Yeah. I can kind of, I remember them, you know, trading for Kyle Turris. Uh, that was kind of like the first big trade. It was like, all right, we finally have like a skilled number two center um, at the time we did. Um, mm-hmm. But, but it seemed like they kept trying to, you know, sort of bring in skill guys, hoping it would sort of work. Yeah. Um, and as a result, it was just like, you know, kind of no line identity, kind of no blend. It's just like, okay, you're the third best center on the roster. So you're going to be on the third line with, you know, the third best right wing and the third best left wing. And you guys might have not have any chemistry together, but you're Mm -hmm. the third best at your position. So you guys are going to be the third line that sort of seemed to be, you know, kind of the, the strategy from at least Peter Laviolette's standpoint for a very long time. And, you know, David Poyle, I don't think should be let off the hook for that either, because I think he was kind of caught between two eras. You know, he wanted to kind of still have, you know, the, you know, the old school Preds mentality. We want them to play, you know, that physical hard grinding kind of way, but at the same time, we want to stay up here among the NHL elite. So we're going to bring in all these skill players Mm -hmm. uh, but without really a clear idea of how they're going to work. I mean, it took, you know, a couple of years to figure out how Matt Duchesne, was going to work. I mean, look at him now. Yeah. Mikhail Granlin, you know, there's another trade who did not work for the first couple of years. And now mm-hmm. over since John Hines has come over here, you're finally starting to see a little bit more of a vision for him and how they want to use him long term. Yeah. But that that seemed to kind of be the story right after the Stanley Cup finals. So here here's a question for you. Clearly they have an identity in which they want to play with. Clearly they have a lot of good pieces who have shown they can do well within that team identity. Is this is enough of a core assuming David Poyle can go out and maybe get some more firepower this off season. Is this a core? Is this a team identity that you think can go back to the Stanley cup finals anytime, you know, in the next five, six years? So I'm I'm gonna preface this by saying I, this is all assuming that they do sign Philip Forsberg, which is sure. not a guarantee. But if they do sign Philip Forsberg and they return with that main top weapon of Duchesne, Forsberg, Granlund, and then Ryan Johansson right behind them, if they can go get some wingers or at, at least one winger that can play with Ryan Johansson and be consistently a good scorer, like I'm just saying, like. 
a 20 to 25 goal scorer, that kind of, that yeah. kind of player. And then maybe the other side of that wing is, is to, either Tolvin or Tomasino becoming a, a playmaking forward and, and contributing to the offense. Then you've got, three consistent lines you've got a really good top line a very good secondary scoring line and then a very physical third line now your fourth line I don't know who's on that line right now I, I if they think it's they might think it's going to be Michael McCarron I think he might be a free agent but whoever that fourth line is I don't know but fourth lines you know can can come and go you can figure out how those work but if you have three solid lines like that yeah I think they can make it make it back and they've got excellent defensive uh, coverage as well with with Roman Yossi and, and Matias Ekholm back. I, Dante Fabro and Alex Carrier may be good enough to keep going, but I, you know, I, at the very least, they've got two top really good defensemen and then a very good goal, goaltender. But they have got to make the right choice in terms of who it is. Mm-hmm. If they go get like a JT Miller, who's older, I don't think that's the right move. They need to go get they need to go spend some money and get a very good young winger, like uh, uh, someone who has some skill. Maybe it's an offer sheet. Maybe they go offer sheet somebody. Oh yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, like they've got to take a risk and go get a 22 year old. And I don't know how many of these are out there, a 22 year old who's got a ceiling of like 80, 90 points in a season, not a floor of like, well, he's always going to have 20 goals. Like go get a guy that like, if he explodes, he could be like a hundred point guy, you know? Um, they need to find that because th- that's what that's what you're going to need to in order if they're not going to if they're not going to suck for a number of years and get top draft picks. The only way to do it is to go like sneak in in the middle of the night and steal one of these really good young players from a team that is desperate, um, like an Islanders team. Like I don't know when Bar is Barzell's contract coming. I don't know when maybe he's already signed. I think he's got a, yeah he's got a while I think left. So like someone like that like a, a really good young player on a team like is, is stuck in the cap Detroit, maybe like, I don't, I don't know what their cap situation looks like, but they've got a lot of young, really young guys. Um, I'm sure you could find someone on like the Rangers. They've got probably tons of cap problems coming up. I'm sure. Yeah. Vegas, Vegas. There you go. Vegas. Exactly. But a perfect example, a team that needs to, to shed some cap in order to, to keep a team around, go find a really young, young player there and, and take them away. That, I think that's the only way. But you asked about the core. I do think that the, that that a, a good amount of the core is good enough to get him to the to the Cup final. I think the way Duchesne played, Forsberg, Yossi, uh, Granlund, and, and Johansson played for the most most of this year for sure. And then with the goaltender and Saros, so I, I really do think so. They just they got to make the right decisions this summer. Yeah, that's going to be the million dollar question, isn't it? Are they going to make yeah. the right decisions? Are those decisions going to pay off? It's a big discussion and a lot of what ifs. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for our listeners, please let them know where they can find you. Yeah, so uh, you can find me on Twitter at AlexDarty1, as you can see right down there. But uh, I'm also on the Preds podcast every Sunday. Uh, check it out on the A to Z Sports Podcast Network. Me and Sean Smith uh, do that every week. We talk about this kind of stuff as well. So, so check us out every, every week, even throughout the summer. So we'll be uh, audio only podcasts on, you know, iTunes, Spotify, all that stuff. A to Z podcast network, A to Z sports podcast network. Gotcha. I'm Nick Morgan. You can find me at on the four uh, If you're following us on Twitter, be sure to follow the show at L O underscore predators. And if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe and leave a comment helps us get this video out to more Preds fans like yourself. That's going to do it for today's Locked on Predators podcast. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. No show on Monday because it's Memorial Day. Go out and celebrate instead. But we will be back next week with player grades, draft profiles, and more Central Division crossovers. So we'll see you then, everybody. Cheers.